factoid you might have in your brain about Sirius is it's the brightest star in the night sky. And Sirius is the proper name for the dog star in the star pattern of the big dog, or Canis Major. Star pattern we're quite familiar with in our northern night sky is, of course, the Big Dipper. We'll look at some myths and stories surrounding the Big Dipper a little later in another session. But as far as uh, looking up into the night sky and trying to find where things are, we have these wonderful maps. These are known as planispheres. Uh, sometimes you'll find them in stores on a discount because the buyer wasn't aware that you have to buy for the right latitude in which you live. And so you'll see them um, in bargain bins because uh, they were purchased for the wrong latitude. But these planispheres are flat maps, uh, oftentimes able to rotate with this dial here and be able to see uh, time of year, month, and time of night and see what stars are up. So it's a map of the night sky. You can have it on your wrist with the planisphere wristwatch. And more commonly in this day would be the smart device apps where you can hold up watch, tablet, smart uh, phone, and it'll tell you what uh, star pattern you're looking at, where it is in the night sky. If you don't have some of these fancy devices to find where things are located in the night sky from where you live, uh, you can print out these sky maps for free, free, providing you have uh, purchased internet, computer, printer, paper, ink, electricity, all that good stuff. So relatively free, we would say, in the world of astronomy. Probably the best place I would suggest to get a sky map is at perfectly named skymaps.com. They'll give you a very detailed month-by-month -month map of the night sky. More local is the Clark Planetarium. If you hover to their tab of astronomy and night sky calendar, you'll get access to a free map that you can download and use. The idea of a map of the night sky is not a new concept. The ancient Chinese here you'll see have a celestial sphere, so a flat representation of the globe of the night sky. Local to Utah in the sense that uh, Von Del Chamberlain, I believe, is from Castledale, Utah, and he is the individual credited with discovering this Pawnee Indian sky map and the night sky uh, pictured on the hide of an animal. You have all probably successfully passed geography, and in your geography class you learned how difficult it is to take a spherical object and actually turn it into a flat representation of this three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional. Now, of course, a flat piece of paper is still a three-dimensional object. We often will say 2D for the paper because that thinness edge on of the paper is very, very small. You may recall from your geography classes the different ways in which we can project a three-dimensional representation into a two-dimensional a flat representation. The Mercator projection is probably the most common that we're used to seeing in posters, in classrooms, placemats, posters, uh, in your bedroom perhaps. And uh, there's quite a bit of distortion that can happen. This is why Greenland looks like it's much larger than the United States, where that's not actually the case, as you can see here. the Mercator projection, but representing the country here by their actual relative sizes to one another. This projection here is slowly but surely being used more often in schools. This is the Gall-Peters projection, and hopefully you see the representation of Greenland being now much smaller than the contiguous outline here, contiguous continental U.S. there and Africa is certainly much larger than on the Mercator projection. Just to put in perspective of how large the continent of Africa is here, 
This is a representation outline of Africa. We've got the whole contiguous U.S., all of China, all of India, all of Eastern Europe, and several other countries. United Kingdom taking up Madag Madagascar here. I mean, Africa is just an enormous continent. Continuing our throwing back to the world of geography, we have the representation of this globe representing planet Earth. And we have this line that separates the northern hemisphere from the southern hemisphere. That line is called the equator. There is not actually someone who was walking along one day and said, I feel something hard underneath my feet, and kept walking, was still there, decided to do a little digging, and there was this bar that uh, appeared and went all the way around the Earth and below the ocean bed. Uh, the equator is something that we as humans have agreed to establish as zero degrees latitude. And your lines above the equator are northern latitude. The lines below the equator are the south latitudes. The city of Greenwich in the United Kingdom, England specifically in the UK, the city of Greenwich is the home house of the universal time system. And this Greenwich line happens to run through the zero degree longitudinal line, which is called the prime meridian. A well, fun factoid here that zero, a soccer stadium in Brazil, or probably would call it football, field, in which the midline, midfield line is aligned with the equator, zero latitude, which makes one team each defending one hemisphere. So kind of a fun pitch where the midline is the equator. As I said, there's not actually a bar that runs through the equator, but there are these markers in various places throughout uh, cities that live on the equator. There's a friend of mine who went to uh, high school with me in the United Kingdom, and she now actually is a French teacher in Syracuse, Utah. And uh, it's a picture of her doing the whole standing on the northern, southern hemisphere. Similar to many people do at the four corners. Put uh, a body piece in each of the quadrants and be in four states simultaneously. So we have this very recognizable sphere that represents the planet that we live on. So globes, representations of our planet. Spherical maps, globes. We also have, in the world of astronomy, these spherical maps, representations of the night sky. And you'll see there's lines that look like latitude and lines that look like longitude. This right here is a celestial sphere or celestial globe or celestial model. All those three terms used interchangeably, meaning the same thing. Celestial model, celestial sphere, celestial globe. This is one that uh, shows the stars by these different dots. And then these uh, swirls, kind of misty looking pieces, where maybe the blue wasn't colored all the way. These are actually representing the Milky Way the kind of cloudy pattern you can see in the night sky. And we don't mean cloudy in the sense that it's water vapor like daytime clouds or nighttime clouds. This is the Milky Way where we're seeing a larger structure in our universe, so us looking out into our galaxy, one of the arms of our galaxy. Another lesson, we'll look at the uh, visualization of the Milky Way galaxy itself. This celestial sphere, if you were to plug it in, is a great nightlight and has the artist's renderings of some of these star patterns. You might be able to make out some of the uh, greats from uh, the zodiacs with uh, Capricorn, the sea goat, Taurus the bull. But a fun little nightlight where no electricity running through, you'll see the celestial map plug it in, you get these artist renderings of the famous star patterns and images. So celestial models or celestial spheres, celestial globes, these are how we chart or navigate or orient ourselves to the night sky. This image right here at the top of this page is what you'll be adding some terms to. So the terms that you're going to be adding to this are right here. 
So uh, let's hit pause so that you're able to draw this down completely. Be sure to catch that the fuzzy little circle in the center is representing the Earth. I'm going to push pause, and once you've finished completing that sketch in your notes, and resume play. Just as the Earth has an equator, we extend that out, and call that very logically, the celestial equator. Similarly, the Earth has a North Pole, geographic North Pole. We extend that outward and call it the North Celestial Pole. The South Pole of the geographic Earth, we represent and extend outward and call that the South Celestial Pole, or Southern Celestial Pole. The reason I want to make sure that you have this in your notes is to key into the concept right here that this is an imaginary celestial sphere. It's not like you're actually going to take off in a ship and you would launch yourself from Earth and you're going to travel and then, whoops, trying to use the pen there. Try that again. You're not going to be on the Earth blasting off into your ship and then, boink, you hit the, uh, some sort of shield or boundary barrier and uh, come plummeting back down. This we're calling, referring imaginary, just to say, you know, we have to have a, put a limit on it. We're trying to map the stars on this particular representation here. So imaginary meaning there's not an actual barrier. We want to have a limit because we're trying to represent the stars and create a map in a holdable, uh, manageable star pattern system. So this right here, we're not saying the end of the universe or all that we've been able to observe. We're just saying for the stars that we're able to see and we're mapping and putting on this globe, we're creating this barrier. Not an actual barrier, just something for you to be able to hold and manufacture. The Earth is always recognized to be in the center of a celestial sphere, although they're not actually manufactured in a celestial sphere. Like It's just one of those things, it's assumed that the Earth is in the center here, and you're looking outwards, up at these star patterns. Celestial equator highlighted here for you. A uh, very rudimentary drawing, if you were to see that on a CK and asked what does that represent, you could answer celestial sphere, celestial model, celestial globe, and be successful there. One of the things to recognize with the celestial sphere is that there is one kind of flaw, if you will, with the celestial sphere, that it gives you the illusion, as these dots represent stars, it gives you the illusion to make you think that, oh, hey, all stars are the same distance from Earth. And they absolutely are not all the same distance from Earth. But if we were making a celestial sphere to represent that these stars are indeed different distances from Earth, then you're going to end up with not a celestial globe, but a celestial porcupine, as you would have all of these different star distances from Earth poking out, and that wouldn't be very manageable or anything that you could actually handle. So bear in mind, with a celestial sphere, we're not actually saying all the stars are the same distances from Earth. And in other lessons, we'll look at how far are stars from Earth. How do we know how far these stars are from Earth? The idea of celestial spheres aren't... Uh, a new concept. This is an old celestial globe. Uh, it's uh, one on display in the London Science Museum. So that's why it's a kind of blurry photo, because I took it. Give you a sense that it can come in all shapes and sizes. This one's much larger. Have a relative reference point for you. That, of course, is me. That'd be a nice addition to the classroom, just off to the side, a nice little celestial sphere. This is a celestial sphere that's property of Utah State University. I had a meeting one time with the department head of physics and astronomy, and we were discussing the possibility of doing an astronomy concurrent enrollment class for Ridgeline. And uh, the course was going to be managed, of course, being concurrent, uh, a college credit course is going to be managed through Utah State University, and they weren't too keen on the idea that the focus of this class is, are we alone? 
is there the possibility of intelligent life? Not that they were opposed to that idea or thinking, it's just they wanted their astronomy course to be very much concentrated on calculating uh, rates at which planets travel around the sun. It had a lot of math in it. Obviously, as a physics teacher as well, I'm not anti-math. I just want students to take and enjoy astronomy and appreciate the beauty of the night sky, like that Walt Whitman uh, poem on the cover of the notebook. So uh, the uh, department head went to get some uh, uh, course catalogs to compare uh, the topics that were covered on campus in their astronomy class. And while he left the room, I look over the corner and I see this wonderful celestial sphere here. Give you a sense of scale, this is a standard outlet uh, for electricity there in the wall. And as I glance over and I look, it doesn't show up well in the picture, but uh, there's actually an opening right here. And I'm thinking to myself, hey, that's about the size I could probably put my head in. Now, don't get ahead of me. I did not actually stick my head in there and get it stuck as the department head returns. Uh, the only reason that didn't happen is because I envisioned that happening, that he would walk back in the very moment that I'd uh, managed to get myself stuck inside the celestial sphere. But uh, this did lead me to an idea that I think could really take off, that... Uh, in the motif of an astronaut helmet, every student has their own celestial sphere, and you just pop it on your head. And of course, there'll be ventilation holes, little star holes here that for get you some air. And you poke your head in through here, and you can just have the globe of the night sky sit on your shoulders, and you can just spin it around as the months progress and time passes, and you do a little whirlwind zip through the night sky. Wouldn't that be awesome? We all have our celestial globe helmets on, and people in the hallway walk by and just can't even try and picture what we are doing in the world of astronomy. We're looking at the night sky in the daytime in classroom sunshine. It'd be fabulous. Much larger celestial sphere here is one at the Kennedy Space Center. It's similar to the Hogel Zoo, where it has the big stone in the entranceway, and you can move it. So here you'll see the star patterns on this celestial sphere. Now the reason I'm going over a celestial sphere and celestial model with you is I know you're not going to go purchase one, put it in the corner of your room, bedside nightlight, although that one celestial sphere you plug in that shows the night sky patterns in artist rendering, that makes a fabulous nightlight. The reason I'm sharing this information with you is so that you can see how we describe where things are in the night sky. So beautiful Ridgeline High School in Millville, Utah. The coordinate system on the geographic globe there, 41 degrees north, 111 degrees west. We use a very similar system in a celestial coordinate way. So if you were to look up stars, where are they located? You're going to see the name of the star, and then probably in the star pattern it's located in. And then you'll see these weird things called bright ascension and declination. This is really saying celestial longitude, celestial latitude. Why we couldn't just call it celestial longitude and celestial latitude? I don't know. No one asked me. That's all right. So they go these fancy terms of right ascension and declination. So you may have a smart device that has some astronomy apps on there, stargazing apps, I hope. Or maybe you go to Wikipedia, what's up in the night sky, or you see on a star map this RA for right ascension and DEC for declination. I'm going to show you using the celestial sphere how that works. So this is a planet globe of Earth, just to refresh your memory. The equator separates the northern hemisphere from the southern hemisphere. The prime meridian, running through Greenwich right there in the UK and many other cities, is separating the western hemisphere from the east, or, uh, eastern hemisphere. And like I said, it would be nice if uh, we just decided to call it celestial latitude and celestial longitude, but I suppose in astronomy we have to mix it up. So. The terms that we use here are, instead of uh, calling the wonderful flat latitude lines, celestial latitude, we call that right ascension. And instead of saying celestial longitude, we call it declination. 
So right ascension and declination. Of course, in geographic giving of your coordinate system, we give latitude first, then longitude. Of course, in astronomy, we had to mix that up as well, and we reverse it, and we give our longitude first, celestial longitude, right ascension. And of course, it's not in hours, or excuse me, not in degrees, like your latitude and longitude on the globe of planet Earth. We have divided the celestial sphere into hours. And the hours aren't necessarily meaning like 24 hours in a day. What they're referring to is the difference between a solar day, what you and I call a day, and the sidereal, sidereal uh, day, which is just a little bit different than a solar day. This graphic's a little bit confusing, takes some time to look at. Uh, one of my favorite things that I get to do each summer is teach astronomy, this course basically, in five days, compressed in five nights, to teachers who are getting their endorsement in earth science and needing an astronomy credit. And uh, we have them for five days and five nights. And as I was uh, one time describing the difference between the solar day and the sidereal day, uh, a parent or a teacher pipes up. She's a parent of a student who's uh, currently in college studying to be an astrophysicist. And at uh, lunch, she had uh, contacted him saying, can you explain to me the difference between a solar day and a sidereal day? And he sent her this uh, little clip that he uploaded to YouTube and let us share with you. It's a classic YouTube video in that there there's a cat that is uh, heard but not seen. So here's one of the best quick explanations of the difference between a solar day and a sidereal day that I have seen. Okay, so as you probably heard, a sidereal day is a day relative to the fixed stars. A solar day is relative to the sun. So this is the sun, this is the earth. Say that's noon, the sun's directly overhead, okay? So the earth is spinning but it's also spinning around the sun. So what happens is it's spinning along and it's spinning along. This is rotating. Here, this is really get... exaggerated, but that's how it works. Okay. So that we're in the same forward direction as we started. That's a sidereal day because the stars in the background relative to that, it's been a day, but since the solar, we would need to spin a little more, then we'd be pointing right at the sun again. So that's a solar day, and a solar day is a little longer. So it's like four minutes longer, and that's why. See, much better explanation than uh, obtained from this graphic for you. Wonderful. The celestial longitude, again, is given in right ascension in hours and minutes, and it actually is a sidereal hours, not solar days. And then the celestial latitude, we couldn't just call it celestial latitude, we had to call it lines of declination, and those are given in degrees. So if you see star charts or maps, these are the celestial lines of latitude that are the declination and the celestial longitude that is your right ascension. I just did that backwards, sorry. These are your right ascension lines and then these are the declination. Right ascension and lines of declination. Sometimes in smart devices you're asked, do you want to have the celestial grid line put in the background? And that's what your smart app is asking. Do you want these lines put up for reference or do you just want the star patterns? So speaking of smart devices, this is what I mean when you want to look and see, okay, is Mars visible tonight, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn? The smart devices are going to list things in terms of this right ascension and declination. Azimuth is overhead and elevation. And oftentimes looking uh, from our location, the mountains get in the way. I know the mountains are the view, but in the nighttime, sometimes the uh, stars and the planets aren't quite high enough for us to see. We'd have to be able to look through the mountains to be able to enjoy those celestial bodies. In a nutshell, 
we have these maps of the night sky that we like to put in a three-dimensional representation. We call them celestial models, celestial spheres, celestial globes. And essentially, we have these lines of bright ascension, which are comparable to what I would call celestial latitude. And then we also have these lines of declination that I would think of as celestial longitude. My main point with you on the celestial model section here is just to tell you this is how we find stuff in the night sky. So if this were representing the northern hemisphere, night sky, this is Earth, and the paperclip is you. Look how ginormous you are compared to planet Earth. There you go. And this is representing North Celestial Pole. If we want to identify where these stars are, it kind of is difficult to be, but right there. It's right there, right there, right there. And so we make use of lines of declination and right ascension. If I wanted to say this is my target star, where is that? Then I would have my line of declination it's running through the three hour. And my right ascension looks like it's about that 30 degree mark. So I'd have three hour. 30 degrees. If the star were below the celestial equator, maybe at 30 degrees below the celestial equator, then we would say it's still at positive 3 hour, but we would say uh, negative 30. So that was the goal of this lesson here, was to make you aware that just as we navigate our way on the planet, we have a system in place in astronomy to navigate our way through the night sky a little bit better than right there, right there, right there.